Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday school. If you got your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 5. Believe it or not, we're getting dangerously close to finishing Mark chapter 5. Maybe next year. Maybe next week. All right, we'll start with uh, what we do each week, our question. What is God doing in you through his word through the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Uh, and just a heads up, the handout for last week, this week, and next week is the exact same handout. So if you've got yours from last week, just use last week. That would be helpful to be serve a little here. So. What is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? <clears throat> oh, Miss Amy, you're waving this morning. All right, here we go. You are. Changing my normal. We talked about with Legion, they noticed quickly that he was changing. That was his normal. His quickly adjusting what I got used to as normal. Quickly adjusting what I got used to as normal. And that's always comfortable, right? (laughs) Yeah, and I'm so, I think I'll change. Praise God for it. Yes. He loves us enough not to leave us looking like we are, but to continue to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Right. My, my normal is one thing, but the normal of my family is another. Uh, you know, my family's normal. That's even more hard. Somebody else, what is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Yes, ma'am. He is um, reminding me that he is my living hope. Mm. He is our living hope. Praise the Lord for that. What is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we have studied so far? Still hung up on Amy. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I like what you're saying because uh, one of the common themes we've had with some of the guys that I work with is that our normal doesn't have to be normal. Mm-hmm. If it's a bad one, through God, mm-hmm. we have the power to change that. For me, I think it's because my normal is so now it's, you can mess with my normal, but now that you mess with my comfort, that's what's wrong. Oh, okay. Thank you for asking that, because I was, I went somewhere, and you knew I went somewhere else, and thank you. Okay. There we go. Jim, can you repeat? Y'all are very patient with me. <laughs> Jim, can you repeat what they said? Yes. Can you repeat it louder? <clears throat> I said, when changing my normal is one thing, but when you're changing my comfort, when I got used to my normal, and so now you're messing with other aspects. <coughs> so I want to ask you a question today, and I'm going to expand on it a little bit, a little bit, Lord willing, next week. Uh, and this is not intended to be a guilt trip. This is not intended to threaten. This is not intended to make you question whatever. Um, but. There should be something that God is doing in you through his word, through the studying of his scripture. And if there is not, that should give us pause. So if you find yourself at this point every single week going, ooh, I've got something, but I just, I don't like to talk. That's great. No issue whatsoever. If you find yourself racking your brain going, I don't remember the last time God spoke through his word that's a problem. So we're going to pull that thread quite a bit next week, so just kind of get ready for that as we do a bit different. So, All right, Mark chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, make sure you're in Mark chapter 5. Um, and feel free to, as we read through Mark 5, uh, just listen. Uh, feel free to read along. Uh, many of you uh, close your eyes and pray while I'm reading, and I think that's great. Uh, I'm assuming you're not sleeping, so... That's how I interpret this. But uh, this is Mark chapter 5. I'm in the ESC. (laughs) 
They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran down and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. And a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She'd heard reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So last week, we started this second major section in Mark chapter 5. So the first section there is 1 through 20, and the second major section is 21 through 43. But we didn't start at the beginning. We started in the middle. And I'm so appreciative of uh, Josh for walking through the text uh, last week of 24b through um, 34, looking at the, the woman who had the issue of blood. And the more I got to thinking about the order in which we did this, the more I'm glad that we did it this way. <clears throat> because I want to walk us through today, uh, 21 through 24, 
And then the first couple of verses after the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And I want us to walk through last week's lesson through the eyes of Jairus. Okay? So in verse 21 on your handout there, it says, And when Jesus had crossed again, so Josh covered this last week, but we went across the sea, we've come back, crossed again in the boat to reach the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. I'm on page 150 of your handout now. And he was beside the sea. And verse 22 starts with the word then. And the implication here is that there was not a tremendous amount of time that broke between when they landed at the sea on the, on the shore and when verse 22 happened. And if you recall, we've had a bit of activity right before this. A lot of activity. It's been one thing after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And he's got to be physically tired. There's been a lot going on. So verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue. And I want to I stop here and, and make sure that you don't hear what I'm not saying. Because I regularly ask us not to go to commentaries and helps first. I regularly ask us to read and to pray and to think and to talk. And to read and to pray and to think and to talk. And there are going to be things in the scripture that we don't have a cultural connection to. A ruler of the synagogue is likely something that we do not really understand what this actually is. So I just want to stop here for just a second. And I'm going to show you a, a good resource that I have found that has been helpful to me. It also makes my back hurt because I carry everything in my bag. And when I put this Bible in, I mean, it's just like 50 pounds crazy. Right? So this is a study Bible. Uh, it's the ESV study Bible. It's really good. <coughs> And uh, when you get to verse uh, 22, if you look at the note, the note on verse 22 says, The laymen who were rulers of the synagogue presided over the affairs of the synagogue. Now, we've used two words. We've used one word twice here so far, synagogue. So somebody tell me what the synagogue was. Church. The, Jewish place of worship. the Jewish place of worship. Was it more than that? Yeah, yeah it was a, almost a community location at times. Um, it's a very, it, it, would, it would have been used for a, a wide range of things in different places, uh, but specifically, the rulers of the synagogue were lay people, and they uh, presided over the affairs of the synagogue, including organizing and teaching in synagogue services. Most of them were, anybody know? Pharisees. You have the same book I have? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, most of them were Pharisees. Now, have we learned anything about Pharisees up to this point in Mark? Yes. What have we learned? They're power hungry. And who do they hang out following around? Jesus. Jesus. Do they hang out alone or do they hang out in groups? Yes. In groups. Okay. The singular and the plural matters, right? So it goes on with a little bit more, but this is a really good, I think, I think, Lord help me if I'm not correct here. I think this is a good use of a help. Here's a term that gives us a bit more context around what this job is, right? Because there are jobs that existed then that do not exist today. There are jobs that exist today that do not, did not exist then. And bridging that cultural gap can be a challenge. Thank you, I've been looking at you four times trying to have you speak up, so. The good. today aren't dramatically different than they were back in those days. How so? Uh, it's still the community center, it's still the seat of teaching the people. It, it's not the temple by any means. Right. But, uh, so let's draw this. That's a good. Let's make sure we understand the difference between the synagogue and the temple. So the synagogue would have been. It, is there was there one synagogue? There we go. At least ten Jewish males. If if you're in a little town, there's less than ten Jewish men. There's no synagogue. There's no synagogue, right? And um, Chattanooga had three synagogues at one time. I'm not sure. I think there's just two now. Okay. Is the rabbi the only person that's ever allowed to speak? Oh no, because they have multitudes of people that teach just like we do here. 
this is, I'm gonna pause for a second. This is why I want y'all to talk to people, because there are people that are rich among us. You get this? I hope you see this. Okay, keep going, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's like our church here. It's not just the pastors. Right. A lot of us that teach on different levels. say conservatively 90% of the time you land the explanation exactly where I wanted to like go right back in it's um, thank you father for gifts like this mm-hmm. everybody says yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well this is the season of Thanksgiving right? <laughs> Ish. so so put your first century hat on and watch what happens. Jesus gets out of the boat, there's a crowd, and a Pharisee, likely ruler of the synagogue, comes up. What do you expect him to say? It's not this. Right? So we've already got this discordancy, this expectation difference here. So then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, And seeing him, that him is Jesus, he fell at his feet. So when we were walking through Mark uh, last year, was it last year or was it this year? At Saudi Daisy with Brian. Was that this year? Was that last year? Excellent. I'm glad I write things down. Uh, Brian's quote on this was, this is what shedding of cultural expectations looks like. This is just not what was expected. So he falls down at Jesus' feet, and verse 23, and implored him. Now this word is translated differently in chapter 5. What's the way it's translated at the places in chapter 5? Beg. This is one of the, if, if Thesa was here this morning, I'd be like, Thesa would have highlighted this word all the way through in some color that I wouldn't understand with a symbol that makes a lot of sense. And this is one of the key words in Mark chapter 5. There's a tremendous amount of begging that goes on in Mark chapter 5. Excuse me, it's just desperation. Very much so. Because... Why? Well, he's a ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus was doing everything against what they they taught, they spoke on in in their minds. And so for a ruler to fall at his feet... Why is he falling at his feet? Because his daughter. Because his daughter, right? and, And, you know, he... To me, as a mother and as a parent, that sits there and go, okay, is my religion more important than my daughter? You know, I mean, and I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying he had to think that. Yeah. Well, where's he likely at in his flow chart? So, all right, so just <laughs> cracking open my brain for just a second. Uh, decision-making processes for me are, uh, I can see them because there's a decision point here, a decision point here, a decision point here, a decision point here. And depending on how you answer these questions, you're going to come to what I would consider to be a logical conclusion. He's probably going he's through the flow chart all the way through. All the way at the bottom. And, and he's done it multiple times. Yes. Yeah. Because I can't imagine at this point, him doing this, he is more likely than not alienating himself from yes. the rest of the Pharisees because he, to some degree, he is recognizing Jesus to be more than what they want him to be. There it is, right there. I think it's a complete <coughs> nine twenty-eight. It's twenty-one minutes. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get there by nine forty-two, but there we go. There you go. Yes, this is a recognition of someone has authority, that someone has power. But it's pure desperation. It's a lot of desperation. So, verse twenty-three, top of uh, one fifty-one, and he implored him earnestly, and, and again that. I feel like a kindergartner griping at a college professor here, but the Greek word means a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean 
earnestly. The, the idea here is he, he begged him uh, often. This was many times. He begged him earnestly saying, and the, the Greek here for saying is a present active participle. This is repetitively. My little daughter's at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Um, Tuesday night, I saw a father do this. Um, Y'all are familiar that uh, David and Katie and uh, Emily Bandy were in an accident Tuesday night. And we got to the hospital children's ER department and uh, got there and, and Emily and Katie had already been taken back and David was refusing treatment and we didn't know what was wrong with him. He was squirming around. It was obviously that he got hit pretty hard. Uh, but he just kept saying, look at my girls, take care of my girls, look at my girls, don't worry about me, take care of my girls. And I'm looking at this through the lens of knowing that I got to stand up this morning and talk about Chiris. Coming at Jesus' feet saying, my little daughter's at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And quite frankly, not a lot of the Greek mattered at that point. Because <clears throat> it was just beautiful. To see a daddy's love poured out for his children in a very, very tangible way. I'm sure there are many of you that have read the scriptures enough so that when you read certain portions of the scripture, you associate them with certain life events. This one's stuck now for me. It was absolutely beautiful. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And then one of the most beautiful responses ever. What did Jesus say to him? What does the text say? It's open book, verse 24. What did Jesus say to him? He didn't say anything. He just went with him. We talk sometimes about the ministry of presence. Jesus knew he was going to do more than just be present. But that's what he started off with. And it's a beautiful example for us. He went with him. And then now we're going to transition into last week's text. I want to walk through this, looking at it from the perspective of Jairus' eyes, who has just finished begging. A religious leader with a tremendous reputation is begging. And this is what he sees next. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. We don't know if Jairus was in the middle of this or outside of it. But the text in 24 says Jesus went with him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood, so she was unclean. Jairus would have known this. Being a leader in the synagogue, it would have been one of his jobs to have known who was clean and unclean. A discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, top of page 153, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd 
and touched his garment. Now the text does not imply that anybody else saw this. Right? 28, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. 29, top of page 154, and immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Verse 30, and Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him. Don't ask me questions about that. <laughs> I got nothing there. Immediately turned about in the crowd, top of 155, and said, whenever God speaks, it is significant. The text itself is the speech of God. This is a quote from God in the text of God. Who touched my garments? Did he already know? Yes. So was he asking for his intellectual no. benefit? No. No. Who is standing there with him? Jairus. I don't know if this was a test of Jairus' faith. Because Jesus just called out, somebody touched me. And his disciples have this conversation. They said, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who, who touched me? And he looked around, top of page 156, to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. It is likely that she would have known who Jairus was and what his position was. I don't know who she was scared of, but she might have been scared of Jairus. And Jairus certainly was scared of her being touched by her. Do you see the complexity of the relationships here? This is not just a bunch of people walking down the road. There's a tremendous amount of political and religious interactions and fell down before him seems to be a trend at this point in this part of Mark, doesn't it? And told him the whole truth. When Jairus hears this, what's going through his head? Verse 34, And he, Jesus, said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jairus is watching all of this happen. And immediately, the next thing that happens is verse 35. And while he was still speaking, while who was still speaking? Jesus. While Jesus was still speaking, he was still saying the words, go and be healed of your disease. There came from the ruler's house some, the word some is actually not in the text, it's just they came to the ruler's house speaking or saying, and this is present active participle, so it's repetitive, your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further? Think about this. He's still saying the words, go and be healed of your disease. And the words that Jairus is hearing is, your daughter is dead. Leave this man alone. Do you think he's got a choice here? He's already made a religious fool of himself by falling down in front of Jesus and asking him for help. Right? He has shredded all of the cultural norms at this point. And he has put his actual job at the synagogue in jeopardy. He's certainly going to be the butt of every Pharisee joke for the rest of his life. And now he's got a decision to make. You see what's going on here? This is incredible. So what does Jairus say? <clears throat> Nothing. What does Jesus say? Oh, what a beautiful voice. What an amazing ability to fill a moment where, where fear was happening. And we know he was fearful because of what Jesus actually says, but overhearing what they said, <laughs> why was he able to overhear it? What can you overhear? What can you overhear? What you hear, what you're near, right? He was close enough so that Jesus could hear what was actually going on. This was not one of those, but Jesus perceiving in his heart, he knew what, this was a physical hearing of what was happening. He was close enough that he heard this person say, your daughter is dead, leave the teacher alone. 
But he knew that already. Yes, he did. <coughs> so Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Believe what? <coughs> The fear there, the do not fear, is an imperative. The believe is a present active imperative. You keep believing. You keep believing. You keep believing. But don't you think that the healing, both of these situations, they're both at their wit's end. Compare them both. She just didn't, maybe she did, but he physicians in that who else day. was at his wits end in Mark chapter 5 yeah but they both had gone with the little girl she'd already he'd already probably been to the physician several times both of them and they are but just might have been the same physicians could have been and he had probably enough money to have to best well. but what did he just see Jesus do Something he'd never seen before. He saw her put her faith in Jesus to do what nobody else could do. He's doing the same thing. But he just saw what could happen. So I think, uh, reading this before, hey, that was a confirmation. I am who I am. So believe. Believe what? Yeah, Mark chapter 5 is just Jesus screaming with his behavior, I am God. Mm -hmm. Tim, we know that in our minds and thoughts, but the real question is, will he do it for me? Mm -hmm. Will he heal for me? Yeah. What's the answer? Hoping we could keep Lazarus till next week. Right. Yes, dying, and then, you know, We're so far like, ahead. Mary and Martha are like, listen, you knew he was sick. Where you been? That's me, okay? That, what took really? so long? That's how I feel about Jairus here. I think that he's like, this is getting out of control here. People don't forget that I've got a need here. Because there are some, you know, people that have needs, I think sometimes we struggle with, all of us struggle with watching God do things in people's lives that are miraculous. Yeah. But yet in your own life, you know, you're still struggling for the miraculous. And hearing her perspective, though, it makes me think differently, too, in the aspect of he's thinking, I am powerful, I'm up here, she's down here, let's go, let's push on. You know, we need... Look at the sequence of people that Jesus interacts with in Mark chapter 5. What direction does the power go? It goes up considerably. So we start from a demon-possessed man living in the tombs to 
to a woman who was allowed in society but was unclean to engage directly with it, to a leader of the synagogue. And who does Jesus present himself to the each as he is? As God. He is God to the demon-possessed. He is God to the unclean. He is God to the religious elite. There is no one outside his authority. It is a beautiful reminder who he is. We hear more, though, that he is of the trouble, of the weak, of the not big. They were all troubled. They were all weak. (laughs) Absolutely. We hear more that, you know, it's stressed sometimes more that it's of the unworthy. Mm -hmm. But we're all unworthy. Hi, my name is Jim. Break that down into simple words for me. Is this can he? There's no question but that my mind that he can. Mm-hmm. Will he? That's the part where I start to just get yep. nervous. So I have um, five words for you. Do not fear, mm-hmm. only believe. When you doubt him, do not fear, only believe. When you're concerned about his timing, do not fear, only believe. If you think he's gotten distracted, do not fear, only believe. If you think he's left you alone, do not fear, only believe. If you think you are not worthy, do not fear, only believe. It is a beautiful, beautiful command to be obeyed repeatedly. And I would argue to be obeyed repeatedly for the rest of our lives. All right. This was emotionally heavy for me today. I had four different people that I love and trust ask me if I was okay this morning. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. They were like, no, you're not. Are you okay? I'm like, well, we got a lot going on in Sunday school this morning. <clears throat> and we got a lot going on in our house, but we'll put that on the prayer request and Darla will be faithful to share that. So. Mark, in typical fashion, is the abbreviated gospel, right? (laughs) He makes for a better sermon. (laughs) All right, on your tables is a weekly update with prayer requests, some of which have been here for years. So here's what I would love this morning. I would love for your table to pick a section and don't shy away from the healing and the physical just because it's long and to pray for every single item in a given section. We don't do this very often, but we need to be faithful, and I think we could uh, practice here and do this. So after you have uh, prayed as a table, you are dismissed to go and to worship the one who tells us, do not fear, only believe. Thanks for coming to Sunday School today, guys.